Good morning. Great to see you. A delight to be with you this morning. Happy Monday. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the threats, uh, as Jennifer has uh, already gone into some detail. Not, uh, I won't talk too much, and then we'll talk about strategy and resources. So these are some of the subjects. I want to start out with uh, a few questions for you, just to gauge where you're at. I know we have a few people in the audience that have some Ministry of Interior or police experience. I myself uh, have worked a little bit in terms of counter-narcotics capacity building, not extensively. Uh, anyone involved in counter-narcotics? You don't have to raise your hand, but if, if, you, uh, if you're comfortable doing that. Okay, no one. How about uh, anyone involved uh, in counter-poaching, counter-illicit wildlife trafficking? No one. Let me ask a different question. Has anyone been a target, either generally or specifically, of cyber criminals? Um, I think probably all of you should be raising your hands. Does anyone have a cell phone? If you have a smartphone, at least generally speaking, you've probably been the broad target of cyber criminals uh, because they don't really care who you are as long as one way or another they can access your financial accounts or exploit you, steal your identity, et cetera. Uh, so we'll get into a little of that. Some threats, some challenges are truly global. Some are limited in one way or another to a certain region. So for example, as Jennifer was saying, uh, where are these ivory tusks going? Uh, well, the market is significant in East Asia, uh, but they're not going to originate in Latin America. They're not going to originate here in the United States. We don't have the elephants. Uh, they're going to originate in China. So, so some, uh, due to their very nature uh, of the vulnerabilities when we discuss transnational crime, uh, are specific to countries, subregions, regions. Liquor and cigarettes? Well, just about every continent produces liquor and cigarettes. Not every continent has rhinos. Uh, so uh, when we think about certain counter-illicit uh, wildlife trafficking, it is specific to Africa. Uh, last week in the Southern District of New York, uh, there were some indictments last week against a criminal ring, uh, an organization that's been operating since 2012, uh, primarily uh, in moving rhino horns and uh, elephant tusks uh, to either East Asia, Southeast Asia, or the United States. They've also been involved in something else, uh, and that's heroin. Uh, and I, I thought this was a good example of how the same types of criminal elements that may move one product don't have much of a moral compunction against moving another product. And for those involved in the value chain, some elements don't know what they're moving. Some criminals, literally, uh, they're either moving money that's associated with the product, or they're, they're moving uh, the contraband itself, but they don't know what's inside the package. Uh, so, you know, these are all dimensions of contemporary transnational crime, which make it increasingly complex. Uh, and in terms of the moral code, of transnational criminals. Do we honestly think that a criminal who's comfortable moving people or moving heroin would say, you know, I'm just not comfortable moving rhino horns because I love animals, so I'm not going to do that. They don't have that, that moral code. So some of the threats and challenges, they vary by stakeholder perception and perspective. If you're in one country, which is a uh, cocaine producer like Bolivia uh, or another country in West Africa where that cocaine is transiting, uh, or a country which is primarily a consumer, such as a Western European country. You're going to have different perspectives on uh, that form of, uh, of drug. Uh, who are the criminals? Well. We have collaborative individuals, we have groups, networks. What about nations? 
can nations be criminals? What if a nation is actively seeking to steal trade secrets? Is the nation criminal? It's something that we have to consider in contemporary times uh, where rogue states, such as North Korea, uh, are involved in all types of illicit activity, uh, where other states may be abetting their private sector to steal commercial secrets, violate uh, copyright laws, et cetera. What are we trying to do? What are the approaches to these threats and challenges? We'll, we'll get into that later, but I, I wanted to bring up right from the get-go thinking in terms of management versus defeat and control. Sometimes the most we can really aspire to do is manage a problem. It's, it's not realistic to try to defeat it or control it. Domains. These problems are in almost every domain, a little bit less uh, in terms of space, but uh, tomorrow morning you're going to speak at length uh, about maritime. That's on the agenda for tomorrow morning. Uh, land, air, uh, all of these illicit products move through different domains, and cyber is a game changer. You know, 25 years ago, we were really dealing with physical crimes. Now we're dealing with crimes that are moving over the internet, uh, and cyber is also connecting those physical crimes and overlapping with those physical crimes in ways that never occurred before, and really were just in the realm of fiction a generation ago. So as we look at prioritizing threats, a couple methodologies, a couple methods you can, you can use are to think of them in terms of what's most dangerous to your country, uh, your subregion, versus what's most likely. So it may be that a threat taking down your electrical infrastructure is the most dangerous. Um, you know, criminals who are just, who've just decided uh, that it's in their interest to create havoc, uh, and they're going to do something egregious working with other elements and then use that gap uh, to steal from you electronically. What's more likely? For many countries, it's cyber fraud, it's cyber crimes, it's cannabis, uh, which is now increasingly complex because in some countries it's legal. Uh, so the legalization of cannabis in several countries has greatly uh, complicated the international market in cannabis. Uh, what are the unknowns? Well, the criminals are often unknowns. Uh, their capabilities are unknowns. Regrettably, the vulnerabilities of countries, of institutions, are often unknown. They haven't done the hard work to identify how they are vulnerable. So on the left is a photograph uh, of cocaine that was hidden in shoes. And all of these photographs represent the air domain. We were just talking about domains and how you can move uh, illicit uh, drugs, uh, weapons, etc. Well, in this case, this was uh, a narcotic that was moved, I mean, narcotics are illegal, but it was moved through a legal route. So this was uh, confiscated in, at the airport in Abuja. Not so the photographs on the right. Now that plane was moving cocaine, uh, just as the photograph on, on the left, but it was moving it through illicit routes. Any guesses as to where the wreckage of that plane is? Uh, it, it, it is, it, it is in the Sahel, exactly, exactly. So it's in Mali. Uh, so, so this was uh, from 2009, November 2009, uh, and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has identified uh, that it was flown from uh, 727, flown from Venezuela. Uh, the, uh, the criminals unloaded the aircraft and then torched it. Uh, now, we've seen all types of aircraft and ships involved in narcotics trafficking. Uh, you know, everything from you know, a plane seized in Liberia in 2008 with 600 kilograms of cocaine to this past year in Algeria, a ship uh, was uh, seized with uh, 700 kilograms uh, of cocaine. Uh, also last year, about 18 months ago, February 2018, another ship, 540 kilograms of cocaine in Morocco. Uh, so whether it's maritime, whether it's land, whether it's air, uh, the criminals are going to move 
uh, their illicit products through whatever means where they have a capability uh, and they think there's minimal risk. So these are some of the types of challenges. Uh, and and I, I'm really not even listing many of the cyber-related challenges on this slide. Uh, so how do terrorists finance their operations? We'll get in to that a little bit in the afternoon, I believe. Uh, but criminality, uh, as Jennifer has pointed out, uh, is clearly uh, a major means of how they do it. Human trafficking, sometimes those that are trafficked, uh, the victims, are used to carry uh, illicit product. Uh, it's really unfortunate, but they're the ones that, that are carrying contraband. Uh, narcotics. Some of the organizations in Africa, and let's take a couple examples, Nigeria and Ghana, they're not nearly as sophisticated, uh, the organizations are not nearly as refined as we might see in Mexico, for example. Now, one of the reasons is scale. The sheer volume of narcotics that move through Mexico dwarfs what's moving through some of these West African countries. Uh, but nonetheless, Nigerian traffickers tend to have rather flat organizations. Uh, Ghanaians, uh, some of them use families who hide behind legal businesses. Others compartmentalize into four categories. Uh, you have financiers, organizers, couriers, local distributors. The organizers keep the couriers and the local distributors away from the financiers. So you may arrest someone at the lower level. They can't pinpoint who is financing the operation, because they don't know. They were never connected to them. Uh, weapons, ammunition, explosives, uh, the crisis in Libya certainly did not help uh, weapons trafficking in Africa. Um, and we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't ignore forms of contraband which are technically legal if moved and sold legally, but it's very lucrative to move them illegally. I mean, cigarettes are a classic example. How many times, because taxes are so high on cigarettes, that we see cigarettes smuggled rather than, than moved legally? And, and there's a number of uh, organizations that I hope they get to uh, when they talk about uh, uh, countering violent extremism. Hezbollah operates on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, operates in, in West Africa, extensively operates uh, in uh, Latin America. And so given how well organized and tightly knit Hezbollah and all its networks are, they're, they're uh, uh, certainly in the mix in terms of transnational crime. Sunni extremist groups, as Jennifer mentioned. But Africa is not just a transit point. As you see from the slide, this is methamphetamines. Uh, Jennifer mentioned South Africa. Uh, this is from West Africa, so they're destroying this in Senegal. They arrested folks on the Malian border. Uh, and given how cheap it is to produce methamphetamines, uh, I mean, one estimate is, you know, $1,500 of input uh, in a meth lab in West Africa uh, will go for 100 times that in Japan uh, retail value or more. Uh, so $1,500 becomes $150,000. Given that scale, given that markup, uh, it's no wonder that criminals are willing to take the risks to become producers, but also we're seeing uh, more users of the range of drugs in Africa, particularly those that are a bit more affordable, and, and unfortunately, meta, meta, uh, methamphetamines are a bit more for, uh, affordable. This is probably a little hard to see, but this slide depicts a number of routes that are used for trafficking and threat finance. One observation I'd like to note is some of the traditional routes that were used for cannabis uh, or uh, common contraband uh, are now being used uh, for uh, other narcotics, for uh, weapons, uh, for increasing volumes of smuggling uh, of people, uh, human trafficking. Uh, so just because traditionally a route was used for X and Y doesn't mean you can't also use that route for Z. So let's start to shift from all these uh, criminal, transnational criminal activities to 
how we can better approach them. Why is strategy important? You covered this last week. I, I just wanted to emphasize that strategy should be purposeful. And what's most crucial are the ends. What are the goals? Uh, if you start with the means, you will fail because people will immediately say, well, we're very resource constrained. We can't do anything. Uh, so what are the goals? Uh, in case of, you know, countering the production of methamphetamines in a country, uh, you may want to reduce it by a percentage. You may want to reduce consumption uh, in terms of uh, flows of, of human traffickers through your country. Uh, you may want to uh, increase, uh, decrease, uh, again, a percentage. Uh, you may want to uh, go after certain types of cyber crimes which your country is most vulnerable to. You have to prioritize, you have to determine specifically what goals are you seeking to accomplish because you can't do everything. And mixed in this is obviously your broader goals for improved governance, for economic development, because illicit trafficking of everything drags down development. It drags down governance. There are many organizations that are involved in confronting transnational organized crime. So the UN, uh, I mentioned the office of uh, UNODC. I'd like to talk uh, a bit about cyber because it is an increasing challenge for most Africans. Uh, and as a higher and higher percentage of Africans gain access through telephony uh, to, you know, banking, well, then they're all increasingly at risk, aren't they? Uh, so the Budapest Convention, 2001, uh, ratified 2004, uh, this was not just Europeans. Uh, Japan, United States, Panama, Australia, Canada, other countries, so it's, it's not that long. You can Google it. It's 25 pages. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's an easy skim. Well, it's a skim, uh, not necessarily that easy. Um, but it, it really is the, the flagship convention in terms of cybercrime. Um, forgery, fraud, child pornography, uh, infringement of copyright and related rights, intellectual property protections, uh, it's all there. Uh, it also uh, mandates 24-7 uh, contact and coverage so that if one nation needs to contact another, it can do so at 2 in the morning on a Sunday, uh, which is important because cybercrime happens constantly. It's not limited to Monday through Friday, 8 in the morning to 5 p.m. Uh, national policies and strategy documents, uh, certainly. You know, your countries will have various policy documents, potentially strategies, which either directly or indirectly address transnational organized crime. It may be a subset to other strategies, but one way or another, uh, these are real challenges, and they have to be accounted for uh, in, uh, in national strategies. If they didn't mention it last week, I'll, I'll mention it, and if they did, I'll reinforce it. Classification is a real problem. Uh, a real problem with, with strategies. If you classify them, if you make them secret so that other people can't see them or use them, uh, it should be very purposely, very deliberately, uh, usually this is for military plans. For a counter-narcotic strategy, uh, one would think for a counter-illicit uh, wildlife trafficking strategy, for a broader transnational organized crime strategy, one would think that this would not be classified. Perhaps a few operational means might remain classified, but the actual strategy, one would think, should not be. And as we start to look at the African Union, how does the AU, how do the regional economic communities nest those national strategies? For those of you that are involved in creating national strategies, how do you nest your strategy? How do you ensure that it is thoroughly synchronized with the African Union strategy, with the regional economic communities, with your neighbors? Because if they're not harmonized, then the criminals will take advantage of those fissures. Uh, they will look at one country's strategy, 
They will look at neighboring country strategies. Uh, they will look at the African Union strategy and they will say, okay, there's a gap here, there's a gap there. This is where we're going to exploit. There's a number of AU documents. Tomorrow you'll talk a bit about uh, the AIMS 2050, the African Union Maritime Strategy. Uh, I, I want to talk a bit about Malabo, about the Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. N now, most of this is actually on personal data protection, although they do have several pages on cybercrime, cybersecurity. Given, you know, that everyone wants to save time, again, you can easily Google this. Uh, you can look at articles 26 through 29, which capture uh, the specific articles on cybercrime. Now, importantly, they encourage certs and C-certs. So, you know, com computer emergency response teams, uh, computer security incident response teams, no matter how, how small the country, uh, if you have uh, an internet infrastructure, one way or another, uh, there should be some type of cell that can respond to crises um, and, uh, and can communicate and dialogue with your partners in other countries, your neighbors, the African Union, uh, the RECs, et cetera. Now, Malabo versus Budapest. Um, was Malabo necessary? Well, if a country's already a signatory to Budapest, you, you could make an argument that uh, the African Union strategy was not critical. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are African Union representatives who would dispute that, um, but, uh, but the Budapest Convention uh, covers what most would, would say are you know, critical facets of cybercrime cooperation, uh, uh, et cetera. Certainly the African Union document, Malabo, uh, is more specific. It's tailored to Africa. So, so I would suggest uh, that uh, since they exist, uh, that countries should look at ratifying both. But to ratify Malabo and to not ratify Budapest means you're only taking a regional approach, you're not also taking an international approach. Cybercrime is borderless. Cybercrime is not limited to just Africa. So why open uh, a country to cyber criminals from Asia, from the United States, from Latin America, from Europe, et cetera? Uh, if you're a party to the Budapest Convention, then you're uh, you're connected through both mechanisms. Uh, bilateral relations, particularly important for physical trafficking in goods. Um, some African countries have one bilateral physical border that is far more important than other borders. Some only have a single physical uh, land border with another country. So clearly, border management, border security, uh, is crucial in terms of approaching uh, countering transnational organized crime. Uh, and uh, as Africa tries to increase commerce, tries to open borders, uh, tries uh, to achieve a passport policy where Africans can move back and forth uh, with, without the need for visas in advance, you know, a unified passport pro policy, one step after another to enhance commerce, at the same time, the risks have to be considered. Uh, and bilaterally, sometimes uh, the procedures, the protocols, et cetera, are crucial because if one or two borders are far more important than others, then the two countries need to be talking to each other. They can't rely just on the regional economic community to do that talking for them. Uh, now, that's not to say that the regional economic communities don't play important roles. They do. Uh, they themselves have promulgated, to use the cyber example, you know, many different documents. So, so COMESA, the Cybersecurity Draft Model Bill, uh, East African Community Draft Legal fr Framework for Cyber Laws, you know, ECOWAS, uh, Directive on Fighting Cyber, cyber Crime, SADC, Model Law on Computer Cyber and uh, Crime and Cyber Crime. So, so they're all involved. How much is on paper? How much is actually used, functional, limited? Uh, you know, that's, that, that's a, a big question, right? Uh, we have to consider 
Is it just sitting on a shelf? Uh, is it a draft forever and no one's implementing it? Or does it actually serve a purpose? And what is that purpose? Other multilateral relationships. It's not just the RECs that play a role. Uh, when we think of transnational organized crime and what it overlaps with, certainly the G5 Sahel, uh, one would think, would have a role uh, in, uh, in the Sahelian countries because of those synergies between all the various challenges. For maritime, the Maritime Coordination Centers, the Zone D Agreement in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, there's one area after another of, uh, of potential cooperation. So let's talk, uh, let's close up with uh, resources. So I've got constraints in red because I recognize that tends to be where uh, the discussion goes. Uh, money is limited. Uh, so institutions, countries, partners, uh, RECs have to be creative in terms of where they find resources. Uh, so if you, can, if you don't have the resources themselves, maybe your bilateral partner does. Maybe uh, a foreign donor does. Uh, maybe one ministry doesn't have the resources, but if it cooperates better with another ministry, it does. Public-private partnerships, particularly in the cyber domain, are crucial. Uh, but also with, uh, with other forms uh, to confront illicit crime. Think about those involved in prison reform. Uh, where do these criminals harden? Uh, where do they end up getting radicalized, uh, which just increases the fusion uh, between uh, radical Islam uh, and transnational organized crime? It's in prison. If you can keep them out of prison uh, one way or another, you can, you can reduce that challenge. So aligning the uh, regional goals and resources, let's be realistic. There are limited resources, the RECs, the AU, uh, they have very minimal resources. All they have is what the uh, all they have is what the national partners provide them, um, whether it's a tax, a fee, etc., um, or what phone or foreign donors give them. That's it. Uh, so, uh, as we consider, you know, the harmonization of priorities and allocations, uh, the types of resource constraints. Um, we have to think nationally, uh, we have to think regionally, um, and one partner, one national partner may have a relative strength, and so they can become a center of excellence uh, for the region. Another partner may have a different strength, so they can provide human capital development, for example. Uh, so we, we just have to factor in the various uh, limitations. So the process, let's, let's close with uh, the process. For salient domains, you have to consider which domains apply to you. Central Africa is not going to focus as much on maritime. It doesn't make sense. So which domains matter the most in terms of confronting transnational organized crime? Um, what are the key threats for your country and for your, your subregion? Uh, where do those threats overlap? What's the nexus? What's the link? Uh, identifying key stakeholders, not just in ministries, departments, and agencies, but among civil society. Uh, drafting the ends, so nesting those national strategies with regional strategies, with the AU, uh, and then planning ways, uh, legal harmonization, cyber fraud protection. One that uh, that is my favorite, and I'm happy to explore it more in the question and answer session, is cyber hygiene. Uniform cyber hygiene st standards. How many people brush their teeth? Oh, good. I'm seeing hands. Okay, I'm so I'm so pleased uh, to see hands. Um, uh, well, uh, the fact is, many of you use cyber hygiene, and you, you don't even think about it. You put virus software on your computers. There are things that you do automatically, but but many Africans are not as well educated as you are, and they don't do this. So, what are the uniform cyber hygiene standards for your countries? Uh, it's important. And, you know, finally, transnational crime is intrinsically a, a global problem. It's not just regional. Uh, so national and regional so, uh, solutions are imperative, but they're not sufficient. You have to cooperate with international partners as well. Uh, thank you very much for your time.